Meet Sam Everington, a doctor in 21st century London. We're one mile away from the Docklands here, one mile away from the city. We're one mile away from the richest part of the country. Um, yet we're in the poorest part of the country with the, some of the worst health uh, that you will find uh, in this country. Not only that, with illnesses that you would normally expect to find in the third world. Every night, Sam deals with the routine caseload of Britain's National Health Service. Hi. Hi. How are you? Oh, thanks. Uh -huh. okay. See who's upstairs. Yeah, okay. From minor flu cases to bedridden stroke Hi. patients. How are you doing now? Not too bad. Yeah. Did you um? Did you try the the diazepam? Yeah, but the other painkiller is better. Right. But with this stronger tablet, yeah, I feel more mobile. Many of the cases that Sam sees could not have been prevented. 180 over uh, 86. It's not bad, actually. But that's not always oh. the case. So how many people sleep in this room? Five. Five. Five of us living in this room yeah. in here. And so there's three in one of the beds. Three, um, three of us. Three of us with, with this one, Maru Fils here. Right. This is dampness, this place on this side of the yeah. wall. That side of the wall is wall. And yeah. it's very bad, you know. Sam also has to cope with illness caused by poor housing and by poverty. And how many people live here now? Well, uh, we've, got, we've got ten people. Ten. How many of your children have got asthma and eczema? I've got three of the children got asthma, two of the children got eczema. Yeah. And how are they doing in terms of their weight and height? Razia is getting very thin and thin, you know. Yeah. And, and she's not growing up, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. My yeah. wife got diabetic, she got wicked. Yeah. and she got uh, depression as well. Well, it's very bad uh, health problems in this area. We have increasing number of people with TB. Uh, a lot of the children are malnourished. Uh, many of them suffer uh, from anemia. Uh, it's the sort of health problems that you would expect normally to find in the third world. When I was at medical school, we never thought we'd see TB. Uh, now it's a normal part of uh, our health care. Sam's clinic in London's East End reflects his view that tackling health must mean tackling poverty and helping people with their everyday lives. Medicine, he believes, isn't just about the prescription pad. It can also mean helping people back into work. The clinic even includes a gallery for local artists. <laughs> Sam's not just a doctor. He's a man who's helping to give confidence back to a depressed community. With children of his own, Sam has little time to spare. Yet he's also one of the top advisors to Britain's National Health Service and a leading authority on health and the community. So who better than Dr. Everington to report for life on a country where poverty is the most lethal killer of all? We invited Sam to travel to Dhaka city, the capital of Bangladesh. Four out of ten of his patients are of Bangladeshi parentage. Yet this was his first visit. Amazing. It's incredible. So many people on the streets. It's very colourful. It's very colourful, though. But Sam has come to a country whose gross domestic product is just one seventieth of Britain's. A country which the United Nations ranks as one of the two dozen least developed in the world. Yeah, I, I just hadn't realised it was this poor. A very few Bangladeshis do have a token stake in the global economy. But this is still a land of more beggars than businessmen. There has been progress. In just 25 years, life expectancy for children has risen from 44 to 58 years. But despite their resilience, people in Bangladesh are almost four times as likely to die before they're 60 as in Great Britain. The two countries where I spent my childhood, mainly Bangladesh and India, and both of these, it, it's true, uh, that uh, in many ways um, people do live much uh, longer and the disease are less common. Uh, the average Indian 
lives today, 15 years longer than the average British did in 1900, though the income level is still lower than, than Britain in 1900. Uh, so I think there are differences. And yet, it is scandalous that, that uh, curable diseases could uh, batter the lives of so many people in Bangladesh and India. The Buriganga River runs through the heart of Dhaka. Half the population have no access to proper sanitation. So Bangladesh's ubiquitous waterways can be lethal carriers of disease. It's incredible just to see children uh, washing in the river like this. Um, no doubt, most of the sewage goes into this river. Uh, and just down the river too, people, other people are wash, washing too with buckets which they're putting into the water. To see a young kid like this just um, jumping into the water and washing is uh, it's really frightening. And the frightening consequences some found in the Dhaka Shishu Children's Hospital, funded mainly by the government, and in a country which spends scarcely over 1% of its GDP on health, always short of funds. But Sam, this is the observation unit. Yeah. Some patients, we cannot put them straight away into the world because we have a, have a limitation of safety. Now. Okay. This is where children come if they're lucky. Children with infections caused by poor sanitation, by poverty. Bashir is unconscious from meningitis. His mother, Aisha, brought him here from a local hospital 120 kilometers away. Kazlina's child is severely malnourished. Ever since she was born, my daughter's arms and legs have been very flabby and soft. She can't sit, so we have given her many medications. But it didn't work, so we brought her to the children's hospital the way from Rampur. That's a journey of some 400 kilometers. Taslina's daughter should survive, but about one in 12 children in Bangladesh die soon after birth. Half as many as 30 years ago, but still over 10 times as many as in Britain. The main causes of death in the first few months of life are actually uh, infections related to the child being uh, born with low birth weight, that is less than 2.5 kilograms, and being growth retarded in the mother's womb, and so is vulnerable to all kinds of infections after delivery. So uh, uh, easily the, uh, the largest cause is uh, neonatal and infant infections. As Sam found, it's not only babies who are at risk from poverty. One in two pregnant women have anemia. And eight out of a thousand die in childbirth. The main causes of maternal mortality in Bangladesh are, I would say, A, uh, the mothers being married off very young, so that you know 50% of mothers are married off by 17.5 years of age. So they're having children when they're pelvis is small, they're not they developed themselves, they're malnourished themselves, so they are having a lot of uh, problems during pregnancy. B, uh, I should think, is lack of uh, obstetric care uh, when they need it. For example, a lot of mothers are hemorrhaging to death. And C, I would say, is uh, violence against women. And there's a lot of uh, uh, instances of violence towards the pregnant mother, the girl, and uh, I would say that would be probably one of the largest causes of uh, mortality. Outside the children's hospital are expensive private clinics. But there's increasing debate as to whether this kind of Western high-tech medicine is really what countries like Bangladesh need. If you look at spending on health across the developing world, there'll be varying amounts. And people often say, oh, this country needs to spend more on health. But you have to say, Who's getting what out of the existing health spend? And you very frequently find that the overwhelming bulk of the money is going on very flash, quality, modern hospitals in the capital. And of course, the elite use those hospitals and the state-of-the-art medicine as good as hospitals in any part of the world. And there is no health care of any kind whatsoever for the rural poor. Now, of course, we all want everyone to have everything, but surely the first priority is the basics of health care for everyone in the country. And in most developing countries, that's not the case. We have got a situation where 
practically all of the training of the health leadership in many of the developing countries has come from direct, either directly from Western institutions or indirectly from the same Western institutions. And they, they have moved away from the kind of medicine that is needed for the majority of the problems of the developing countries to the kind of medicine that is needed for the developed countries. The Agargao slum in Dhaka, conditions that breed diseases that can be cured if the right medicine is available. Before Sam leaves for the countryside, time to reflect on health in the city. I'm right in the middle of Dhaka now. Uh, I've been really shocked by the poverty uh, and the enormous amount of illness, particularly in young children. Uh, we just spent a day uh, in two hospitals and seen children with infections here uh, that are deadly, but back in the West would be treated very easily with a simple antibiotic. Half an hour from Dhaka, the village of Charigram Tama. The countryside of Bangladesh may look picturesque, but there's poverty here too. This morning, a rare visit by a doctor from the city. Dr. Everington is visiting from London. He's come to see Sabeda Begum, who's just had twins. In Britain, she'd have had specialist care in hospital. Luckily, with help from the local nurse, her children are fine so far. Well, yeah, what sort of immunization does the children have? Mm, yeah. Sam's told that Sabada's children will be immunized. With help from foreign donors, Bangladesh is now able to immunize six out of ten children with the latest vaccines. But that still leaves hundreds of thousands unprotected from common diseases. These are diseases, vaccine preventable, that take hundreds of thousands or perhaps millions of lives in the developing countries. But those countries have been too poor even to take up these new vaccines. And so you have people dying absolutely clearly because of their utter impoverishment. Next stop, the Ganeshasthaya Kendra People's Health Center. Dr. Zafra Chandra's patients are local villagers who haven't been able to safeguard themselves from disease or who couldn't afford the most basic drugs. Most of the diseases prevalent here are easily treatable and can be cured. It will depend on two things, education and some basic medicines. Basic painkillers will help, here is a simple like paracetamol. But some diseases require more than paracetamol. Yeah. TB is really, really, it is in the increase. As still TB treatment is minimum six months. TB medicine is so costly, it costs really for one week's treatment, it costs two days wage. Still, over 60,000 Bangladeshis die of the disease unnecessarily every year. Tuberculosis can be used in many ways as an indicator of the performance of a public health care system. Uh, the sufferers, the tuberculosis sufferers are generally the poorest people in society and are unable to pay for, for therapy in many, many instances. In addition, you need to provide tuberculosis therapy for a minimum of six months, and the doses must be directly observed by a health worker or by a physician or a nurse. And uh, in order to get a system like that together, one needs to have a, of a strong commitment to public health for the entire population, including poor people. So what's happened is as countries uh, like Bangladesh and uh, certainly in Latin America have attempted to pay back external debt, one of the things that ha have had to be sacrificed is a kind of public health care infrastructure that would lead to high quality treatment for diseases like tuberculosis. To buy health care, people here have sold their cows, tin roof, and become poorer. Almost people they started selling the blood. You're saying people actually who are ill sell their blood in order to pay for their health care? Yes, exactly that's what I'm saying. And how much do they get for their blood then? About a pound, about a one sterling pound for once you've been bleeding, really good. And it is almost two days' wage. 
two days' wage. Wait. And how much health care do they get for that money then? I would say really completely the wasteful. Most of the time it's the wasteful. It's a wrong health care. That is the most sad part of the story. You have even given your soldier other assets, including the blood. Yeah. Then you are not getting the right health care. Yeah. Poor people are generally not very healthy. And if you are not healthy, you cannot work well. And you also spend money trying to get healthy. So the little money that you have, you want to spend in trying to get healthy. You go trying to get healthy and you are not on your farm, you are not going fishing, and you are not producing anything. And this can be looked at at the national level too. A healthy population is a much more useful uh, tool for development activities than, than an unhealthy one. With patients even selling their own blood, Dr. Chowdhury wants to show Sam how he's helping. We are trying to create a job for the daily rural women. We train women in a variety of things. If the problem is poverty, the remedy may be jobs. Jobs the global economy does not provide. We are not that excited about the global market. Mm -hmm. We think our people are too poor to take the benefit. So Dr. Chowdhury is doing what Sam is doing in London. He's turned part of his clinic into a workshop. These women aren't nurses, but local villagers. Their masks protecting them from glass fibre they use to manufacture chairs. These for a local football stadium. It's a whole question is, are we going to allow the poor people to have entry into the into opportunity? That is the main thing. So that's what we do here. From my salary, I look after my mother and two children. My husband is not a good man. He doesn't pay anything for us. The money I am earning, I am spending on my children's school fees, books, clothes, and so on. Why is a doctor you creating all these job opportunities? Simply doing out medicine doesn't create health. Employment has got a tremendous effect on the health care. So employment really leads to good housing, good sanitation, good and good health. And that's why really we are creating more and more jobs at the rural level and a better family life. Back down river, Sam returns to the capital. Here in Dhaka, just as in the countryside, poor people desperately need work so they can afford modern medicine. But as Sam's about to be reminded, being healthy in the third world isn't just a matter of combating disease. At the Diarrheal Disease Research Center, American doctor George Fuchs works on the cutting edge of cholera research, but spends much of his time looking after children who are not diseased, but malnourished. Um, so this is our nutritional rehabilitation unit. As I mentioned to you earlier, about two-thirds of our patients uh, that come here each year are children, and 80% of them have malnutrition. But I think you can see how skinny this little I wasted. See these little thin little arms. How old is this little? Eighteen months. Eighteen months. So I mean that's the size of what? About a six-month-old infant? Eight, five, eight yeah. months. It was eighteen months old. This child's earlier in the rehabilitation phase. And I want you to compare compare it to this this child that we just saw that was eighteen months. Now, no doubt it's still malnourished. But you, See how this one is brighter eyed, is more interactive with the environment. Mm -hmm. And you know, as a mother, mother also is mother. Which one? Which one are you going to, as a mother, respond to? Mm -hmm. You respond to the one that's interactive, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. In terms of wanting to provide uh, more input and mm -hmm. care. This clinic is also a canteen. Teaching mothers to prepare the right food is a crucial part of the treatment Dr. Fuchs prescribes. Most nutritional rehabilitation units are using formulas, commercial formulas, are very expensive. This is very inexpensive. This is Kitri, a diet that was developed here uh, that's fairly nutritional, nutritionally balanced. And uh, it's inexpensive. It's using locally available foods. So we teach the mothers how to prepare this. And we have a demonstration kitchen out in the back. And they learn how to prepare this so that when they go home, they can, uh, they can feed the children themselves, prepare this. Almost half of all infants in Bangladesh are born low birth weight, that is 2,500 grams or less. 
And those infants right off from birth start disadvantaged. Those low birth weight infants have more death due to diarrheal disease. They have poor development cognitively, so they don't do as well in school. Having half a population starting off disadvantaged like that has enormous consequences for the country's economic development. What you're saying is that, that um, health is critical to economic development of this country. Yes. yes. It's a, a direct link. Uh, nutrition and health, yes. You can't develop a society economically and uh, financially if you don't have good health. One. 1.2, 1.3 billion people live on less than one dollar a day. And the diseases linked to poverty is a devastating uh, blow to the opportunities of these families and people to move out of their poverty. Because the health of these people are linked to their ability to learn, their ability to believe that their children will be growing up as healthy individuals uh, and they are in a vicious cycle of ill health and poverty. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to News at 10. Hearty and red carpet warm welcome awaits the US President William J. Clinton. It is the first As Sam prepared to leave, Bangladesh prepared to welcome another guest. It was to be a warm welcome for Bill Clinton, even though the U.S., like many other Western countries, has cut its foreign aid budget to developing nations. This is a country, the United States, for example, where since the beginning of 1996, the gains on the stock market are $8 trillion. Would it be so much to take 1% of that, maybe $80 billion, to put to use for poor people all over the world? You could get everybody vaccinated with all of these new vaccines, no problem. You could use that money to develop the new vaccines for malaria, for tuberculosis. I'm talking about 1% of the capital gains of the last four years in the United States. But it hasn't even reached the political radar screen. At the last count, 30 million people in Bangladesh, one in four, have no access to health care. When I came back into my clinic, the first thought to me was how lucky we are to have the National Health Service. <laughs> I work in the most deprived area of Great Britain uh, with enormous poverty and deprivation, but it's nothing compared to what I've seen in Bangladesh. How do you feel about that? I feel quite uncomfortable, actually, in a funny way. Um, I feel quite uncomfortable um, because we just don't know what true poverty is. I'm 